in Chinese companies play a very important role in it. From this list, we can see that companies like Alibaba, Baidu, Tencent, Huawei, Pinkab, etc., are backbone of open source contributions, especially Ali, which has held the first position in the contribution list for 10 consensus years. Yeah. And I'll take two minutes to briefly describe the scientific method behind this ranking. One of the research area in our lab is performing GitHub behavior log data analysis. The number of complete logs in 2020 was at uh, an 86 million. And in 2021, it topped 1 billion. And there are a lot of interesting things that can be analyzed from these behavior logs, such as who made what contribution, when, through what contribution, collaboration, and with what impact. We even created a niche research area called Open Metrology, which is a systematic study using data science method. We measure, model, and analyze project developers process an other object to deliver is to understand the metrics such as activity and influence. The relational graph data is very useful. Mathematical tool is similar to page rank, which can be used to calculate a typical metric value across the domain. And this is done through an open source project called Open Digger. At present, many technical analysis articles, academic papers, industry-wide papers, government reports, etc., are cited from with open data. And to provide a better service, we have recently launched another open source project, Open Leaderboard, which is a monthly ranking list, which gives you a very visual view of the global and the Chinese open source development, including project ranking, organization company rankings, and the developer rankings. As you can see from this chart, and the two organizations from Alibaba and the AND group are ranked very high in China today, based on which I think our panel today will also be very repressive. By the way, the data project behind this list, Open Digger, is also an open source project currently incubated in the Mulan community, a neutral organization similar to a foundation in China, behind which is the China Standards Institute, who also reflect the government's contribution in participating in and supporting the construction of open source ecology. And the Chinese government att uh, attached great importance to the construction of a global open source ecology. However, it is uh, equally evident from some of our analysis that there well, is still a clear, a clear gap between Eastern and Western countries in the overall open source ecological contribution. The inference metric here, which is calculated by the method of global graph analysis I mentioned earlier, reflects the position of a project in the overall ecology. Our main gap is mainly in the overall volume. The average inference of our individual project is very close to or compelled, but the number of projects that Chinese company open source is still significantly behind other international companies. Nevertheless, with the global trend of enterprise activity embracing open source, OSPO as the brain of enterprise open source governance and uh, operation is already a consensus among everyone. I am also very happy to have the opportunity to talk with the leader of OSPO today. Our listeners must also be very interested in the practice of how companies promote open source in behind. Okay, let me, I first introduce so much. Okay, thanks Mr. Wang for the Soros introduction of uh, XLab and the work, um, the work of it. Um, and I think what's really uh, good about 
open leaderboard, as mentioned earlier, uh, is beyond project and developers. Uh, this product also presents indicators such as activity and influence for a large organization, specifically for commercial corporations. And um, it must be not easy for companies to use, to participate, and even to contribute to open source. So that's what I really wish to learn from uh, Richard and Amber as um, two, as the managers of uh, two very great OSPOs. So what are the challenges that makes it so crucial to set up an OSPO? Uh, uh, let's start let's from, start from uh, church. church. Uh, yeah, sure, I can go first. Um, yeah, so thanks, Professor Wang and Xiaoya. Um, as we co-started and group SOSPO last year, we realized the need for OSPO actually comes from the fact that doing open source as a corporation is intrinsically harder. There are two, two primary reasons associated with that. One, the overall cost and risk exposure as a corporation. Two, it actually takes longer time to build momentum. So participating in open source is actually much easier as an individual. You just do it. There are clear costs, such as time and energy, and relatively clear goals, such as social recognition. It's easy to evaluate. On the corporate side, things are different as the oral costs and potential risk exposures are actually higher. There are risks associated with improper actions, such as compliance risk, legal risk, or security risks. Through the proper use of licenses, it provides certain levels of protection. But there are still non-trivial compliance of business PR risks lingering around. Similarly, the overall cost of doing open source is also considerably higher. Depending on the nature of the project, you need to thoroughly think through from a strategy perspective on how the project should be productionized and governed. There's also this co-star problem. It's not easy to make someone who never done open source to fully embrace open source software and community best practices. The engineers are less motivated to write documentation and it also takes significant amount of effort to build habits for asynchronous communications, just to name a few of the challenges. So if the open source is hard with so many challenges, why would corporates still want to do it? This is because comparing to individuals who participate in open source, the potential reward, quote unquote, from being open is pretty high. For instance, a to be tooling SaaS service or software, if done right, can directly benefit from being open sourced. The to be software ecosystem in China is also quite, is not quite the same compared to the Western world. It requires more than one project or team's effort to make a company's open source successful. So we do need to measure those risks, costs, and gains. This is actually where the metrics will come in. Uh, we'll also talk about that later. Um, the second reason, uh, it takes time to actually build momentum. Another challenge actually comes from the fact that it takes time to you know, really build up all these open source practices. Investing in open source is typically a long-term plan which requires dedication. Why? Some of the immediate problems are relatively easy to address, like providing open source license consulting for teams, but many other things, including but not limited to as we call the culture of being defaultly open. So as all the asynchronous communication practices, actually takes much longer time to fully realize their potential benefits. There might be people challenging you along the way. Corporate investment open source is similar to investing in research institutions. The benefit is more long-term than short-term, and evaluating short-term gains can be tricky. So committing to open source, was, uh, committing to open source ways requires top-down dedication, as well as bottom-up understanding. Let me handle this to Amber. Thank you, Richard, Thank you. and I can totally agree with you. And before I try to answer the question of why OSPO, I'm going to give you a brief introduction about Alibaba's open source journey. And first, Alibaba's businesses comprise China and global e-commerce, local consumer services, cloud computing, logistics, uh, digital media and entertainment, and so on. So we started our open source journey very early, back to 2008. And uh, so far, we have more than 3,000 open repositories at GitHub, which attracted more than 13,000 contributors, 30,000 contributors, and more than 1 million stars at GitHub, which is quite impressive. And uh, 
Our journey in open source has gone through three stages. And the first stage is from 2008 to early 2010. And back then, the old Pomo movement is still in its infancy, and the influence is mainly in North America. And Alibaba is more of a user of open source software. And we contribute, uh, we occasionally contributed back to the open source projects that we use, like MySQL. And the main goal is to use open source software to replace expensive pro proprietary software to reduce cost. And this is only the first stage. And the second stage is from 2012 to 2019. In this stage, Alibaba has witnessed the value of open source, especially its impact on technology and in, in technology influence and its value on re attracting high quality employees. So we started to open source our own projects. For example, RockMQ, which is the uh, unified messaging engine lightweighted data processing platform. Because Alibaba has unique business scenarios like the e-commerce uh, shopping festival, uh, like W11, and we are one of the biggest users of our, our own open source projects that we have, we can incubate a lot of great open source projects like Double and RockMQ. And this is, uh, in this stage, we, we do have open source technology community, committee, which is a virtual team composed of Alibaba technology decision makers. Uh, to act as executive sponsor to make decisions of what to open source and what not to open source. And, but, but now, back then, we still don't have an OSPO. And the third stage is from 2019 to till now. And it is not, not until 2019 that Alibaba has established uh, the OSPO. For, and the first, for the first time, we have the full-time employee to work in OSPO. In this stage, the OSPO's responsibility is to work closely with the Alibaba Open Source Technology Committee on open source strategy, compliance automation, big project facilitator, and developer and academia outreach. So in a nutshell, why OSPO? Uh, our main goals was to ensure that as a company, first, we are good employees. We're setting the boundary between proprietary code and open source code. And second, we are good open source citizens. We are not breaking any rules in the open source world. We need to respect the open source license and making sure we're giving back to the open source projects that we depend on. And third, which is the most important reason is by investing time and effort in the open source projects, we need to ensure that Alibaba is having its footprint of technology footprint in open source ecosystem. So these are the three main reasons I think OSPO is important for Alibaba and the main reason why we started OSPO back to 20, uh, 2019, not in the first place. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks Richard. Richard. Thanks, Richard and Amber, for sharing the story and the ten points a, a company and enterprise faced. Uh, so I think after knowing why a corporation needs a OSPO, it's important then to ask how. How do we perform it? So as mentioned before, we can see Alibaba and N Group uh, ranked very high regarding the uh, corporation activity and influence in open source based on the behavioral behavior, behavioral data on GitHub. So would you share with us the story of how you govern and maintain open source within a large corporation? Because I think that must be useful use cases for other companies. We can start, we can start from, from, from there. Sure, thanks, Xiao Yao. And I really agree with Amber. So there's always open source projects and there's also not the other way around. Um, so N Group also has open source projects way before we have OSPO, which we only initiated last year. So N Group open sourcers built top-notch front-end projects such as N Design and V, ActJS, back to 10 years ago. Um, we also have a top-notch um, back-end projects like OceanBase, which is a uh, industrial grade um, for business um, HTAP database. We are also rich of um, cloud native projects such as uh, SofaStack, which was actually the first open source uh, project the company did on the backend side, um, as well as Mosin, Layoto. And we are also exploring uh, new areas like uh, Cushion Stack, 
as I try just to name a few. I would say we begin our OSPO practices um, primarily last year. Uh, I summarize the overall OSPO role as maybe one principle and three practices. So the principle is OSPO would be the go-to entity for both internal and external open source related matters. In engineering terms, we identify OSPO as a facade or a public API which abstract internal capabilities and in interact with external world. Why would this public API metaphor? Because the public API is designed to last. So it's a contract with the external communities and entities. To do group actually help normalizing and standardizing OSPO. So it becomes a common terminology and potentially a common belief that we can all fall back to. So we don't need to start from zero to explain that we need a governing body which could help the company manage open source compliance matters as well as blah, blah, blah. Instead, we can just say, let's build OSPO. We do believe that not all OSPOs are created equal. So it's actually by design for OSPOs to take different forms. Just as what Amber described, as OSPO and Alibaba also, we learn actually from each other, but we also have distinct characteristics. So on end side, uh, we focus on three primary practices, um, two on the internal side and one on the external side. On the internal side, OSPO is actually a necessary infrastructure to enable developers and their teams to open source compliantly and confidently. So this aims to help internal engineering teams. The primary focus of this work is fair-heading processes and best practices for projects and community members to learn and follow. So if we go down one level, we're focusing on tools and utilities such as all the SCA, SAST tools, communication tools, and utility tools which could help achieving that. Metrics is also a key aspect as observability is typically a critical factor of infra. And the second practice we do is we consider OSPO as an enabler. So we can actually do open source without OSPO. So what does OSPO really do? In our terms, OSPO is actually act as a catalyst to a chemical reaction. The catalyst itself will not achieve much, but it either makes an impossible reaction to happen, or it actually enhances the speed of the results of the reaction. So Ant Group OSPO actually helped our projects as it grow. We first provide strategic planning for goals, governance consultation, operation plans design, just to name a few, as well as potential go-to-market strategies to actually help the projects being more professional and successful. The metrics and evaluation criteria provide North Star guidances for our teams. So they would have some impartial and professional references, which they can directly relate it to. This is also why we're active collaborating with X Labs and the rest of the research institutions. Last but not least, the third practice is on the external side. We would like OSPO to be the deal maker. There's a book I really love, The Rainforest, The Secret to Building Next Silicon Valley. On my first read of that book, it actually talks about success factors of Silicon Valley. But on the subsequent reads, I felt everything the book was discussing can be applied for open source communities. The book actually mentions that even though there are many other places with similar concentration of talents and investment, what made Silicon Valley so specially successful was the network hubs. So there are those well-connected individuals with a giver style, and they connect startups with, with investments. So the book refers such existence as a deal maker with a positive connotation. So at the facade, which connects with the external world and communicate with communities, foundations, and other collaborators, OSPO has a potential to be this deal maker. For instance, good projects like OceanBase or the cloud native projects actually can benefit uh, from all the consolidations that uh, OSPO is actually acting as a, as a facade so that we can actually aggregate all the external demand to offer our projects all together as a unified solution. Just to give one example. Let me handle this to Amber now. Richard, and I can totally resonate with you, and we definitely learn from each other um, about how, how to work in the OSPO. And talking about OSPO practice, I think the to-do group is already doing a great job um, by raising the awareness of OSPO and creating content out there on OSPO best practice for different organizations to learn. And the OSPO mind map which is created by To Do Group, give us a great bird eye view 
on how to set up roles and responsibilities for OSPO. It also gave us practical advice on how to set up the right size of OSPO. It can be a full-time employee, large or small team, a virtual team, or a single full-time employee managing multiple functions. And the best advice I can give you give to the uh, the uh, to other organizations who are thinking about setting up OSPO is don't think about the roles and responsibilities first. So think about the organization's goals first. It's not about how to do the OSPO right. It's just about what goals you want the OSPO to achieve. And uh, do I already have the right person, right talent in the organization to reach the goal or solve those certain problems? And uh, like I said, it was not until like 2019 that Alibaba set up its own OSPO with full-time employee. And still we are a very agile and very compact and hybrid team working with our legal department and risk management department. And uh, as a such compact team managing more than 3,000 open repositories and some of China's most vibrant open source projects is such a big challenge. But at, as a horizontal team, we are working with expert teams on tooling automations, both in governance and community management. For example, we have, that's why we worked with XLab for a long time to measure the influence and health, healthy level uh, for our projects and making sure we are monitoring the right in the right direction. And we are definitely not just looking at the uh, star figures on GitHub. But there is no secret formula that you can apply to your organization that if you want to set up an OSPO and really make the impact and get the value out of your effort. So you have to set up the right goals and get the right people to work together within your organization and leverage the effort. And I think this is the uh, advice I can give you to, to my peers who are thinking about setting an OSPO, uh, OSPO from scratch. Um, well, I, I really couldn't agree more with Amber on the best practices side. Um, in fact, I mean, the OSPO best practices should be uh, very golf centric and back to our three practices. Um, we focus on the necessary infra and on that particular front, um, we actually focus on the governance side back a lot. Back to the risk we mentioned, typical companies will have security and compliance teams. That said, open source security and compliance requirements are specific. After finding those alliance members, the next step, okay, let me do this again. Crap. <laughs> I was totally off sync. Um, okay. Um, all right. Um, I really can't agree more with what Amber mentioned. Setting up OSPO's best practices should be very goal centric. So, back to the three practices I mentioned, I would offer maybe two additional tips uh, which we can actually use to. Uh, setting up OSPOs from ground up. The first one is finding all the lines you can find. So actually back to the risk we mentioned, typically companies will have security and compliance teams. That said, open source security and compliance requirements are specific. Furthermore, as open source communities means code and documentation is visible on public internet, branding and PRs would like to work with us too. So after finding those alliance members, next step will be refining and standardizing the methodology. And once we have the methodology, uh, the next question will be about tooling. So this coherent theme um, is actually following through when I actually set up the OSPO from ground up. On top of that, and the group is actually facing an additional challenge. We have multiple phase with the group, um, which are facing different compliance and government, uh, governance requirements. For instance, MI Bank, which is and group's affiliate, is an online bank and a financial institution. Mm -hmm. So there will be additional regulations and compliance requirements for using open source software specifically tailored for banks on top of all the open source requirements we already have. So that's one aspect. And another aspect is really about all OSPOs are created differently. We can definitely use our imagination. Uh, while to do Group actually provides a very standardized practices and all the reference material can have, I would strongly um, suggest everyone to actually use their imagination to identify internal and external clients and really trying to solve their problem out of the, I would say like the regular practices. Um, so for Ant, uh, one thing we did is um, we actually adopt the lifestyles, uh, all the life cycles of CNCF used internally uh, and provide end-to-end -end support for open source projects depending on their stage. 
So project is start from sandbox stage in which we would help the team to refine and focus on their primary goals. And the as uh, and the as a criteria for open uh, for sandboxing is actually the team review. We review the application with the joint board, including but not limited to the TOC compliance expert, security expert, brand expert, as well as the trial. Together, we make a diplomatic decision on if the project is ready to be open sourced. And once open source actually pass our joint review in inter the incubation stage, depending on the nature of the project, we will focus on designing the operation strategies as well as potential commercialization strategies with the project team. So it's actually a rinse and repeat process that also works closely with the project team. For the mall, we actually have inner source as a staging environment, which people can put their projects in to learn and grow. Inner source by definition, is this internal environment in which people can actually share their projects as if it's being open sourced, but it's only visible to the whole corporation. By offering engineering a playground internally, it significantly reduces barrier of contributions and sharing. Engineers who actually shine and contribute to open source directly felt more comfortable in an inner source environment. It also acts as a perfect playground for setting up good practices like documentation rules, async communication rules, which solves the fundamental problems that OSPO faces. Just to add a few additional, uh, I would say, pro tips to our discussion. Thank you. Thanks, Richard, for adding the uh, structure and introduce to us uh, how different uh, department, the project team, the security team, how they are interconnected and co uh, collaborate with each other. That's very inspirational. Thank you, Richard and Amber. And I really like the idea that Amber mentioned how uh, the design structure and, and the strategy of an OSPO should be based on the organization's goal. OK, um, I think the data insights, the way we measure the tool provided by XLab um, illustrated today and um, two best practices thesis of the two rather significant hospitals in China are inspirational. And uh, so that's all the panel discussion for today. Uh, thank, thank the audience who listened to this panel. Um, thank you. Yeah. Thank, thank, you. you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We still see well, you offline soon.